My name is uh, Frank Cepelina, and I'm a retired NASA Goddard Space Flight Center employee. And um, I've been at uh, NASA for some 50, 60 years. And so I have a, coming from a lot of background experience. But I want to talk today about something very, very important to me, and that is uh, something that started roughly 45 years ago, 45 years ago at Goddard called the Satellite Servicing Effort, and uh, where we stand today and where we've been and how we're coming along. And then Ben Reed will pick up and talk about the present and the future of satellite servicing. But we started in the design of a, of a concept kind of a screwy concept at the time, it was 1972, 1973, to, dis to find out how we could design satellites that could take advantage of the shuttle's two-way capability. And I have the first slide, if you could put that up. Um, and the, um, the idea of this um, concept or team effort, ad hoc team effort that we started at Goddard, was to basically, um, take advantage of the two-way capability of the shuttle, being able to launch satellites, being able to retrieve satellites, and more importantly, in our aspect, being able to repair them in orbit should something go wrong. And in those days, uh, the, the probability of uh, problems associated with launching of new satellites uh, was pretty high. We always had two, three, four problems within the first or second or third year of operation. So we started with the design of a modular spacecraft and uh, that would incorporate shuttle two-way capabilities, but more importantly, would incorporate the EVA operations of a satellite being repaired by astronauts in orbit. And that was the key aspect of our effort. And to do that, we went with a modular spacecraft design. And you can see the, uh, the, uh, the picture on the far right uh, of Solar Max. Solar Max was our first spacecraft design. We started design in, in 1976 and launched it in 1980. And in 1984, the, we had an opportunity to go repair the satellite because the attitude control subsystem module had had inertia wheel failures. And uh, that module uh, is uh, the farthest module, closest module to you on the picture, the white module there, and it was re replaced by the astronauts. Can I have the next view graph? So the, the, the um, result of the repair was rather startling. It took a two EVA day repair activity. It took the shuttle to use the robotic arm and uh, the uh, shuttle operator uh, Bob Crippen to reach up, grab it, and capture it while the satellite was moving and rotating at a third of an RPM. He was able to do that very, very um, easily with uh, the motion control of the shuttle and the, the use of the robotic arm to reach forward and capture it. And we birthed it, and the astronauts took care of replacement. So it was a very successful repair mission. The satellite operated another six or eight years. Uh, before its demise. And then we went immediately within the next six to nine months and captured West Star and Palapas to two satellites, commercial communication satellites that had failed. And um, they had uh, propulsion module failures and the astronauts with EVA and the use of the shuttle and robotic arm were able to capture them, store them and bring them back home. So that was a big, big, big turnaround uh, situation that validated the use of the shuttle to be more than just a launch vehicle, cap launch vehicle capability. Brought it back, those satellites were relaunched and put back in operation and operated successfully in another 12 or 14 years. So we went from there to CINCOM uh, 4, which was a um, which was a DOD mission and which its kick stage turn on command switch had failed. And the astronauts were able to capture the satellite, flip the switch, and put that satellite back in operation, send it back up to geo, send it up to geo orbit. And then after that came the launch of GROW. GROW was kind of an interesting thing because 
Grow was designed to be modular, was modular, was serviceable, and on checkout and deployment from the shuttle while still attached to the shuttle arm, it was discovered that the high gain antenna, the lower boom antenna you see down there, had failed to deploy. So it was brought back into the deck, the astronauts went out, repaired it, put it back in operation. And then that satellite lasted for another 12, 14 years. Then Intelsat, um, Intelsat 6 was the next satellite and um, it was repaired about a year before the shuttle launch for Hubble. And again, the took three astronauts to capture it, put it back, berth it, put a new propulsion module on and relaunch it and it went into operation. And as far as I know, it's still operating. Um, of course, and then from that point forward came the five famous Hubble shuttle missions. And Hubble servicing was not the first mission that was done in terms of shuttle servicing, but it was the one because of its notoriety that basically took the took the ball game by this. And then we basically did five successful missions. Next is that. So those successful servicing missions, which culminated, first of all, with restoring the optics by putting a brand new optical configuration sensor, which changed the configuration of the optical lenses, going to the optical images going to each of the instruments in the telescope. And uh, it basically corrected the, the misconfiguration of the polished 100-inch uh, diameter optical mirror inside a primary mirror inside a Hubble. And it basically established the re capabilities of what was looked for to be the most startling breakthroughs of, in our uh, astronomical view of the universe. So that was solar max, that was uh, servicing mission number one. And um, next view graph. In the early days of these marching through these missions, we focused primarily on being able to restore the health of the satellite Hubble by replacing appendages and by replacing these great big instrument modules that weighed roughly a thousand pounds a piece and were three foot by seven foot by three foot. Uh, and you can see they, they basically were uh, huge instruments. We had to open up the doors, install the instruments. And it took a lot of, uh, a lot of training and a lot of new breakthrough technologies and instrumentation. Next to you guys. So the first two missions focused primarily on, um, on that sort of thing. And then we gradually got more sophisticated and more uh, confident. And we started doing replacement activities on instruments and spacecraft subsystems that were never designed to be replaced. And um, the particular shot that is a force servicing mission on EVA day four, and I just bring this up out of order, because it emphasizes the fact that on it, we were able to change within the individual instrument, which costs, in this particular case, um, the instrument for imaging spectroscopy, we were able to replace a circuit board. And that instrument cost about $300 million and without ever taking it out or bringing it back home, fixing it and relaunching it, we were able to replace a circuit card with the development of all different types of mini power tools and some robotic tools. Next, we go. Now that was the uh, that was the last servicing mission, and on the last Hubble servicing mission, we went even one step further. We basically be we started with the concept what we call, I call the first surgery on orbit, where we took an astronaut and developed a bunch of tools for him and allowed him to cut a hole in the side of the instrument, one of the other instruments that had failed, and cut a hole and basically remove a complete power supply, a complete power supply card, install a new one, plug that hole up, again with special robotic tools that he was able to use, special manipulated, hand manipulated tools that he was able to use, and put the instrument back in operation. And that instrument uh, was known as the instrument for infrared survey work um, and, on the, and that was done on the last servicing mission. Now, 
along with all of that activity, uh, next view graph, uh, there was a failure between the second mission we call 3B and mission four. And mission four, the in between that phase, Columbia had failed. And the present administrator at the time declared that it would be unsafe to approach Hubble with a shuttle and do another servicing mission. So he asked us to go find another way to do it. And we did. And we were started in, we got through a year and a half's worth of work in designing a robotic servicer that would do essentially the same thing using a Canadian 39 foot arm and two Canadian robotic arms at the end of that arm called Dexter. And they would basically do the kinds of manipulations required for the satellites, uh, required for us to put new instruments on board Hubble Space Telescope. So we, in between time, between the third and the fourth mission, studied this, this capability for the uh, robotic repair of Hubble. And from that robotic repair and all that design activity um, came the, the next generation of robotics. And I just want to say that we went on, the, a new administrator came on board, discovered that by putting two launch vehicles on pad simultaneously, one to go up and rescue the other shuttle should the other shuttle get into trouble while it was servicing Hubble, we could bring the crew safely home. Now that never had to happen, but that it was interesting that we then went on with a port servicing mission and did all kinds of things like instrument repair on in situ and robotic surgery on one of the instruments. Um, so now the, all of this technology lent itself to one very important facet. And that important facet is that eventually the station was getting many, was getting more and more capable and having, it was starting to experience aging failures. And so the technology by which we could robotically repair things was transferred from Goddard to, um, to uh, the station folks where they would get the tools. They'd, in fact, some of these Hubble tools are still on board space station and use those tools to do repair activities on station. And then finally, in the end, and, and uh, Ben Reeves is going to talk about this next view graph, we use this robotic arm combination with the two arms that you see hanging at the end of the Canadian arm, the 55 foot arm. You see two robotic arms, the right and the left side of the arms are on each side. We use those arms to conduct an in-orbit telerobotic complete refueling activity. And that basically took us to the end of the, uh, to the end of my talk and Ben Reed will pick up from there. And it launched us into what we call, what I call the phase three or the full robotic operation where now we think we can robotically repair and refuel satellites in orbit. And Ben's gonna to speak to that. So that's about it. Uh, thank you very much.